So in this presentation, you're going to get some great tips and tricks on reviewing your policies and procedures and your processes and seeing how you can integrate them. Hello and welcome to our ongoing series of compliance webinars presented by Mango. My name's Craig Thornton and I present these sessions uh, on all things to do with compliance. We'll be joined again by Andrew Thornhill from IRM Systems based in Melbourne in Australia. Thank you very much, Craig, and welcome to people listening today. So yeah, today's topic, what are some strategies and tips we could apply if we have a current system, management system and uh, with a lot of documentation? How could we look at either reducing that or integrating some of that? Um, that's just a link there to my blog and YouTube channel. So today, today's topic, yeah, we're just going to start with a bit of a refresher. So what is the purpose of documentation we create from a compliance perspective? And I think that's a really good starting point. We'll be clear on that, as well as what does ISO actually uh, define or mean as documented information. We will also run through, well, what are some risks and also opportunities if we do choose to either reduce or integrate some of our documentation. We'll have a touch of a refresher on, well, what documentation is actually mandatory under the new standards based on, uh, uh, you know, uh, any of those based on Annex SL, that um, common management system model across ISO 9001 and the other ISO management system standards. Uh, then we'll get into, okay, well, what are some of the tips and tricks around integration and reduction? As a little bit of background, uh, I think it's a very pertinent topic. What might be of interest to people listening is, yes, certainly for IRM systems in a consulting capacity, uh, it's one of the most common questions or common assignments we, we get from customers is we've got this system that's grown really huge. What can we do to make it more manageable, more targeted, more focused on risk? And also to make it better as a, uh, as a tool to communicate what we really want to communicate. Okay, so let's just start on our background, coming back down to, yes, compared to the earlier ISO standards, most of the listeners would know ISO, the International Organisation for Standardisation, in its recent standards is now using this term documented information. You can see the definition there, I've just taken that out of ISO 45001, being information required to be controlled by an organisation, as well as the medium on, what, on, on, which, in, on which it is contained. Now, the next quote is from, uh, fairly radical organisation, you might have heard of them, ISO, so this is I'm making a bit of a joke there because sometimes when there's debates and discussions around well, how much documentation do we need, ISO, the committee that wrote the revised ISO 9001 standard actually published a guidance document on documentation, what it is, what's its purpose, what mediums can it be in uh, and how you can approach it, which is, is a very interesting document. Now, pulled out some of the key things here. So they do, one thing they highlight early on, and they even use the word stress there, this ISO committee, that documents may be in any form or any type of medium. Um, and you can see some of the options that they actually cite in, in the document you'll see referenced on the next page. Now, I've highlighted that because yes, I do still see lots of organisations, we want to develop a management system. Here's the first requirement in that management system. Let's develop a procedure for it. Well, hang on, even ISO is saying, you know, it can be in a whole range of mediums. It doesn't have to be that traditional documented kind of procedure where we highlight the you know, purpose objectives and related documents and all of those kind of things we've traditionally done in the past. Now, what's really good is ISO in the document, you can see reference at the bottom there. Um, if that link doesn't work for you, um, you can just Google search ISO uh, 9001 guidance on documented information. It'll come up, make sure it refers to ISO 9001 2015. But importantly, they talk about, well, what is the purpose of documentation we create? And four of the key purposes they highlight there. So it is about, the first one I think is critically important, we create documentation or maintain documentation, communicate information. Uh, yep, can provide evidence of conformance 
It can help us share knowledge within a business as well as you know, maintain our organisational knowledge as well. So some really important purposes there. Um, and I'm, I'm going to come back to those purposes because really probably tip number one, if we've got documentation that's not really related to one of those purposes, well, we can start to say, well, what have we actually got it for? And I'll, I'll come back to that point a little later on. So just, again, a broad point, I'm going to run through some fairly obvious risks and opportunities uh, if, as a business, you decide that, hang on, yes, we either, we want to reduce and look at opportunities to integrate our documentation. Well, there's some benefits or opportunities there. We'll look at some risks in a moment as well. But yes, it can make the whole administration of your system and management of your compliance and your risk more efficient. It can reduce duplication. Um, as well as complexity, and the third one's an interest. That's in the first line's an interesting point. There, I have seen by potential for conflicting requirements. I have seen situations where safe work procedure is saying something that's in conflict with what perhaps a quality procedure says, or could impact on what you're trying to achieve through a quality process, as an example. Yes, um, where there's efficiency, there can be some cost effectiveness. I think the third one is relevant. It is very hard to go out to an operational workforce in a manufacturing or construction environment and say, guys and girls, here's the safe work procedure, here's the environmental work procedure, and here's the quality work instruction you need to follow for one task. It's just hard enough to get people to look at one document, let alone three or four. Uh, yes, it can also help with the last point there, clarifying accountabilities and responsibilities. I'm sure we could add, as a group, we could add to those dot points there. That's fairly high level. Same with, oh gosh, bear with me a second. I've just, just going to, yep. Uh, if we want to integrate or reduce, yes, there's also some risks. Uh, that I think the top one is very relevant. Sometimes it's in, you know, that if we integrate our system, we lose a little bit of the focus we used to have on environment or quality or safety when they were separate systems. Unfortunately, sometimes the environment, environmental system tends to become the poor cousin a little bit when we uh, integrate. So yes, that's something to bear in mind. If you do want to integrate, let's try and reduce the likelihood of uh, losing that focus. The second dot point is quite a big job. We do get organisations saying, can you help us integrate or cut back this documentation? Well, it is a pretty big job. So if you're going to do it internally, Treat it like a project, essentially. You're going to need some project management skills, a schedule, a plan. Um, you're going to need resources, things like that. Where I would actually advocate, you know, get a business case signed off by your senior management team, so that they understand the full scope of work involved. It's not necessarily something we can have knocked off by next Friday. Yes, some risks around acceptance of change. We used to do it this way. Now we're suggesting a new way. Yes, there can be resistance to change. Um, vested interest where you know, someone just wants to protect their patch a little bit. We don't, I don't want to get rid of these documents because I'm the owner of them and that might affect me, that kind of attitude. The last dot point can be a little bit hard to assess, but it is really important. And I could sum that up by saying if we've got, if we're struggling to implement and maintain one quality system or one safety system, for example, Perhaps we're not ready to start integrating two or other, three other systems in there if we, if you know, we're the kind of culture where we're uh, struggling just to maintain one system. That's an important business decision as well. Um, now, one uh, area, just I think it's really important, and I'll come back to this on a later slide. It's I do see organisations I work with where, and even compliance practitioners where we struggle to understand the difference between a process and a document. So if we're going to implement a safety induction uh, or if we need to manage working at work at heights within a business, yes, we can create just create a procedure. Uh, but I always advocate it's better to look at that in the context of a process, whether that's a product inspection or safety induction, whatever it is. Think about it as a process. That opens it up to the fact that there, you know, there's a whole range of controls we can apply to achieve uh, the outcome we want. 
if we use safety induction as a simple example, the outcome might be that we want our team members to understand hazards in their work area, key hazards, and understand what they've got to do to manage that. Okay, if we start to think that more about that, don't just jump, let's document a safety induction procedure, don't just jump to that, let's think about that as a process. Well, then we can start to think about some of those other process controls. So what training is required for the people presenting that? Uh, what experience and qualifications might people bring to the table? That might affect you know, what level of induction they need, things like that. Um, as well as, I've got that hierarchy of hazard control on, on the right hand side. Just to really emphasise that yes, documentation can be important, it can be mandated at certain points in ISO standards or regulations, uh, but yes, it is an administrative control, so we do need to be looking higher up the chain as well. Can we reduce the risk through any of those, in a reasonably practical, practicable sense, through elimination, uh, substitution, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, so that's just I pop that slide there so that we can start to think more broadly. Not just here's a requirement. Let's write a procedure and develop a register to prove, from a compliance perspective, that we've done it. If we think about a documentation as one as a range of process controls, you, you will get a better outcome. Now, I'm also highlighting up the top in the box there that, you know, yes, uh, the quality standards always had a big focus on the process approach, but all of those ISO management system standards that I'm taking, uh, uh, you know, for example, if you look in the introduction to the safety standard, ISO 45001, it's talking about plan, implement, check, monitor, and improve processes needed to achieve the kind of OHS policy and objectives that you're aiming for. That's what you're trying to do through a system. At certain points in that standard, yes, they highlight required documentation, but it's not all about documentation. Now, we're starting to get into, we're going to start with if we want to look at broader opportunities before we even look at integration is, well, can we reduce some of the documentation we've got? Um, so this is really the approach I do take with customers, uh, is number one is to come back, look at the existing documentation they do have within their system and their kind of compliance portfolio and really ask that hard question because what happens over time, and I think a lot of people, if we reflect it within our businesses, yeah, it might have happened within your business as well, is we develop some procedures, someone comes along, develops some, some more, customer says we need a safety plan, so we develop more, an auditor says we need a better corrective action procedure, whatever the case might be. So the level of documentation just keeps growing and growing and growing. I'll give you one example right now. I'm working with a customer. For whatever reason, they've got a safety and quality system. They do a little bit around the disability standards as well but their system has grown to 500 documents with 90 safe work procedures and they don't provide complex services and it's a low risk work environment. So in that kind of situation, yes, we do need to start asking that hard questions. What, what, where has all this documentation come from? So number one, yes, is it actually required by a standard? And I had a link back to a process, I mentioned processes already because Often I see a slight misinterpretation in both standards and laws or customer requirements where an organisation says, oh no, no, we're required to document that. And when you look back at the customer requirements they're trying to meet or the standard they're trying to meet, if you read it, the requirement carefully, it's not actually mandated that you document your approach everywhere. And we just saw the broad quote from ISO 45001 saying implement safety planning management review and improvement processes. Um, one simple example, I mean I do external audits as well, one simple example if we look at uh, in the new standards, the very first requirements, so ISO 45001, 9001, the quality standard or the environmental standard 14001, they talk about the context of the organisation and 4.1 is internal and external issues that could imp impact on your intended performance. If virtually every organisation I've ever been involved with has documented both their approach and an output to that. If you read that requirement carefully, it doesn't mention documented information at all. Now a comment I often get from my customers is, well, 
you know, maybe we don't have to document it, but then what do we show the auditor? And I've got some other videos on my YouTube channel that explain whether you're an auditor or an auditee, how you can demonstrate a process to an auditor and the evidence to support that. And I wasn't personally, I wasn't involved in the ISO committee that uh, rewrote 9001 or any of the other standards, but if you look at their guidance document on documentation, I think it's clear that ISO recognised that, you know, that's an example of a new requirement. Personally, I'm second guessing this a bit, I haven't mandated documentation because rather than the quality manager draw up a summary of internal and external issues once a year, we go into the management review, it gets looked at by the management once a year for about three minutes as part of a 10 minute management review. You know, half the management team have gone to get a coffee, that's not very effective. It's What it's really giving you is an opportunity to increase the effectiveness of that, get it in regular management meetings. ISO is not mandating heavy documentation to prove that you're doing it, but if you've built it into your senior management process and that's something they look at regularly, even ISO knows that's going to lead to a better outcome. Okay, So I've laboured that first point, why is it actually documented a little bit too long, but also second example, under the law, I often get, I mean that example of the current client I've got who's got 90 safe work procedures, yes if you look through the hierarchy of controls and the, the laws in the state they're in, uh, they work under the um, the model uh, WHS, safe, uh, WHS regulation, if you work your way through that, yes it says you've got to identify hazards and risks, seek to reduce the risks, apply the hierarchy of control uh, at a level that's reasonably practical, but even when you get down to the administrative controls, well there's a whole range, administrative controls is anything related to people, qualifications, training, competency, on the job training, it's not mandating that bang you immediately need to develop a safe work procedure for everything. And that's where, I, personally I'm not anti-documentation, if a document's a good, a safe work procedure is a good way within your business and that leads to an effective outcome, great, but don't just assume that's the only approach you can take. Uh, and if there are other strategies to lead to better outcomes, you should, that, that's what I focus on, that's what you need to be looking at. Um, so number two, that's just reiterating probably the previous slide a bit, yes, for anyone listening who's not really clear on what a process is yet, I would really encourage you to go back to revisit the standards, improve your understanding of that, that then can open up our thinking that we can apply a range of process controls to achieve the outcome we want. You can almost reverse, a good approach, reverse engineer there, what do we want to achieve out of a safe, a safety induction as an example, and then let's, what do we need within our process to get us there, basically. Oh, just moving a little bit quicker. Just, just, yep. just pause on there, yep. I know you're trying to get through it, but just pause on there. Um, if people, yep. wanted, particularly about the process versus the outcome, uh, uh, if I can just uh, recommend listening to a previous webinar that I did with uh, Greg Smith, uh, the lawyer out of Perth, uh, and he talked yep. about process versus outcome where he's saying compliance people are focusing way too much on process and not enough on what you're trying to achieve with the outcome. So uh, I'd highly recommend going back to that that webinar, check through our blogs on our website, have have a back, uh, listen back through that that webinar, he, he was fantastic. He's, he, he's sort of uh, looked at what's happened in the courts uh, to see what, what, what actually works and what doesn't. Mm. So. I uh, highly recommend listening to that. Look, excellent point Craig and I've actually got Greg Smith's name on my notes here to talk about right now too because the other point he makes, he, he released a book last year called Paper Safe 2019, it's on Amazon for about $15. Personally I think the best uh, safety book, you could apply it to other areas of compliance, so food safety, your environment or quality and a really key point he makes related to today's topic, if you've got if you over document things and you can't actually administer and do everything you say you're doing in those documentation, that documentation, uh, for example 90 safe work procedures, if we can't feasibly do everything in there, uh, you know Greg's a guy who defends organisations in court where there's been serious uh, harm injuries or even deaths and he's saying that if you're not actually doing everything in there it actually becomes your biggest, you know it's not covering your ass in court as organisations and 
sometimes think and sometimes safety managers tell their bosses that that's what it does. He's saying if you're not doing everything that you state you're doing, it becomes your biggest single biggest source of legal liability as well because the, without going off topic too much, is that yes, you're basically a uh, prosecuting team will have very smart people who will look through, identify things that you're not doing and then actually use that as evidence you're not providing safe systems of work um, and, and use that to sort of, yeah, demonstrate that you're not providing safe systems of work. So that is, can't recommend his book enough uh, and there's a, you know, that's a very serious issue related to you know, documenting that we're going to implement certain measures and controls that we never, in, that, you know, we put it in our safety manual to impress a customer or an auditor and we never intend to do it, you're really exposing your organisation substantially there. So I'm going to jump back, excellent point Craig, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, point number three there, I do see a lot of procedures and organisation I was working with recently, it was one example, a 22 page incident reporting procedure, technically probably very correct and looks great within the safety department, staff can't understand it. it, it, it its value as a learning tool is not high. Now, I'm not an educational specialist, but if you look up any kind of uh, models or guidebooks, guides around how people learn or how people retain information, reading can be important, but it's down towards the lower end of effectiveness. People learn by observing, doing, listening, things like that. Now, reading can be thrown in there, but where we come back to that purpose of documentation by ISO, to communicate information and organisational knowledge. I think this is a really important point that, hang on, it's not, if all you've got is documents, uh, it's, it's, yeah, they're not a particularly good, and it, particularly if it's all just text, they're not a particularly good learning tool. Yes, you can make them visual. I've been to a mine site recently where a lot of their high risk work activities, you could click a button on a, anyone could click a button on an iPad and they had a video, uh, presenting you know, key people who do that task regularly saying here's the hazards, here's the things we've got to look at. Fantastic because not, you know, obviously within a workforce there's different literacy issues and things like that as well. One other point, that I, the next little uh, dash there, I often find there's a big difference between what the writer of a procedure thinks people need to know, we and, and I do this, when we're writing a procedure we put down everything possible related to incident reporting. But that can, you know, that varies to what the reader actually wants to know. Most people want to know, if you're giving me instructional guidance, I want to know what have I got to do and how have I got to do it, and that's it. So that's another strategy we use to kind of cut down procedures that are, you know, I, at the, tw the 22 page incident reporting procedure we worked with on that customer, with a customer recently, it just wasn't getting the message across. The workforce, it wasn't providing an effective guide uh, and the workforce didn't know how to report incidents. Another little technique we do, I mean I put eight, 18 safe operating procedures there, I mentioned another customer with 90, every single one of them says purpose, objectives, definitions, related documents, related legislation, things like that. Uh, that adds up to hundreds of pages, a little technique we've used, done it with HR, procedures, safety procedures, quality procedures, is put them all into one you know, safety manual or one HR manual, things like that. It can be a way of cutting down just the bulk. You don't have to repeat all the definitions all of the time as well. Now, look, software, obviously Craig and I are associated with Mango and I'm not just going to blatantly plug that. Craig, are you playing the subliminal music for, hopefully for everyone? Um, but obviously a joke. The point there is, I mean, personally as a consultant who's offered documentation and systems to organisations for a long time, one of the key reasons, you know, I present Mango or, you know, there are lots of other software options out there to customers is it is a great way to standardise a process very quickly and across all sites. So one example of a customer in the print industry working with recently, got sites all over Australia, everyone reports accident incidents differently. Uh, they were, the history is a lot of those sites were privately owned when you go to the Perth site, they're still reporting things differently to the Melbourne and the Sydney sites, things like that. We went, I put a software product in, we agreed on the workflow, the terms that come up in the drop down menus with the executive and the IHS committee and bang, that's it, you switch it on, there's only one way to do it now. And it can all, so 
for consistency and as a means of cutting down a lot of documentation, that can be a really good way to go as well. So coming into our integration, so we've talked about reducing doc documentation strategies there. If we want to look at integration, I'm going to look at integration from probably two perspectives. The first, the first one is really saying, we always advocate, here's a procedure on that's too long-winded, I'll stick with the incident reporting one. You know, let's work with the people involved and look at how they actually do it, or particularly with operational procedures. I see some that are you know, technically really detailed from a safety perspective, written by the safety team, safe work procedure, 10, 10 pages long. It's not really reflecting how the team do the job on the day and manage the risk on the day. And that is it. So yes, even the standards advocate, if you look at under the leadership requirements at 5.1, they do identify leadership accountability to identify opportunities to integrate the system into standard practice or even at a, integrate the system at a, into standard strategic kind of practice as well. And that can be a real, you know, let's reflect what we actually do as we use plant and equipment or as we perform mowing activities rather than also that, you know, if you look at any of the lean or Kaizen methodologies, they talk about reviewing your process. If here's a step we're getting everyone to perform, it's not reducing the, the safety risk at all. It's not helping us meet a customer requirement. It's essentially waste. They talk about the concept of process waste. Let's take it out. That's another strategy as well. Uh, from a standards perspective, yes, ISO has rewritten a lot of their management system standards based on Annex SL. We've got about eight management system standards, so 9,001, 14,001, 45,001, for example, are all based on the same model. They And some of the requirements are very, very similar, and even some of the definitions and wording within requirements is standardised as far as possible. And ISO have overtly said they've done that to allow you to integrate if you, your management system if you want. Uh, so yes. A full, I've got a bit of a table there. I've got this table is actually you can download it from my resources page and it goes right through those three standards. All clauses identified. Well, yes, for example, at the bottom there, 6.1.2, the environmental standard talks about identifying environmental aspects. That's there's no real equivalent to that in ISO 9, sorry, that first column should say ISO 9001. Um, so a little bit harder to integrate there, but if we look at clause 6.1, actions on risk and opportunities, as one example, um, then you can read through what's required by the different standards. There's some minor, it's an example of a clause where the, the basic intent and requirement is the same. There's some minor variations, but there's no reason why you can't take an integrated approach. Um, as well as a lot of the listeners would already know, some of those common management system requirements, management review, corrective action, incident reporting, uh, internal audit, setting up objectives, things like that. The requirements across those standards are very document, documented information, they're very, very similar. There's absolutely no reason you can't take an integrated approach. But step one is really you know, going through those requirements in each standard, understanding the minor differences, in some cases there, making sure you're covering those minor differences. Um, so we're going to use the example of actions on risks and opportunities. It's really saying, I mean, some of the minor differences, I'll just go back a step, is yes, 14,001 and 45,001 require that as you're identifying uh, risks and opportunities that need to be actioned, you need to consider your compliance obligations, pardon me, and your hazards and your risks. That's about the only difference to 9,001. But it's really saying up the top there we can plan an integrated approach. Well, how are we going to integrate our, uh, our process for taking action on risks and opportunities? Um, so, so if we have a procedure, yes, we could integrate that and we could also have an integrated output as well. So you can think at both of those levels. Okay, if we have a procedure, let's integrate that. And as you can see in this output here, it's really identified. This is identifying those internal and external issues, uh, risks and opportunities, and what, uh, as well as it should have some of the stakeholder expectations in there. But the last column, what kind of, you know, what actions are we going to take on our, at a high level on our risks and opportunities? But 
the, the content within that little register is not that important. It's just highlighting that if you look through it, we've got some safety and environmental issues, risks and opportunities rather, we've got some quality ones as well. Okay. No reason you can't have an integrated output. Um, another case study, this is just probably with this kind of approach is where we say, okay, let's have a look at a, you know, an area of the standard or some of the requirements, so section nine, the performance evaluation requirements, really good put, way to start is to say, well, what are you already doing? What's current accepted practice? Uh, what might be current accepted practice from a safety perspective and or a quality perspective and or an environmental perspective? And can we integrate the other elements, quality or environment, back into that safety inspection process, for example, is a, is a very easy way to look at integration opportunities because as an example, if we've got a that print business I mentioned, if every, if, oops, sorry folks, if every site is doing a monthly safety site inspection, it's a very simple kind of concept here. If that mainly focuses on safety, well, let's bring in, sorry, the first line should say, yes, if it's standard practice and we're looking, mainly focusing on safety, well, let's bring in some environment and quality criteria in that site inspection. Easy opportunity. Same for, I won't go through every example, but we're doing pre-site checks on the plant and equipment, primarily for a safety perspective, or can we bring quality and environmental criteria into that an environmental one with the damaged hydraulic hose there. Now that's, a lot of organisations have already taken this step. Their pre-site checks have got some quality elements in there as well. I won't go through every one of those. Some of those kind of practices probably relate back to section eight of the standard operational control a little bit, but it's really saying, now before we just write up a procedure for monitoring and measuring or one of the elements of section nine, well, how do we already test, check, monitor, evaluate things? Let's identify those existing tools so we're already integrating existing practice Let's evaluate those existing tools. If they've mainly got a safety focus or a quality focus or an environmental focus, can we use them as more of an integrated tool as an example? I won't run through all of those, but you, you could ask the same about your calibration process. Preventive maintenance process is an example where it says integrate E, that means environment. Uh, it's something, yes, in an external audit I look at with a lot of businesses and you can see that they've got all their regular checks and testing of all their kind of equipment that's related to a safety risk in some way and you say, well, hang on, why not, you've already got this preventive maintenance process, why not include your environmental control equipment, air emissions equipment and that, et cetera, in there as well. Uh, some of the resources I've got, I've got the web, web page there. So the two, I'm just going to highlight two of the resources on our resources page. One is we've mapped out all the documented information required, both the documents and the records under the three standards there. You're welcome to download that, that's free. Uh, we also had that table highlighting section six uh, a little bit earlier, this one here, if I just go back to it. Um, we've got a second document in our resources one called comparison and it looks at each of the clauses in the standard and you know uh, what the related requirement is in the other standard. So they're useful tools to get you started. Many thanks for that Andrew, and if you enjoyed that video, why don't you click on this link here to see how you can create your own integrated management system manual.